Brothers and sisters, this month, we are in um, a series for the entire year. It keeps saying this every Sabbath, but for those who um, are guests and may, you may not know, we've been in a series for the entire year called what, y'all? Oh, Lord, help us today. It's called Entrusted. What is it called? Entrusted. Basically, we're talking about stewardship this year, but every single month has a different emphasis, and this month happens to be the Word of God. Amen. We have been entrusted with the Word of God. Pastor Gomez did a, a powerful uh, job last week preaching on this subject, and I just simply want to follow in his train today. Would you do me a favor? Would you take your Bibles and would you stand with me today? Stand with me. I want you to turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 119. Yes. Psalms chapter 119, and I want to look at one verse um, today, and um, I'm going to tell you straight up, this, this may be one of the most boring sermons you've ever heard. <laughs> so do your best to stay awake today, but I promise you there is a word for, from the Lord for you. Amen? Amen? Psalms 119, and I want to look at verse 11. A verse I think we all know well, or at least have heard, yes. but maybe haven't explored as deeply. Here's what the word says and from the King James Version. Thy word uh -huh. have I hid in my heart oh, yes. that I might not sin against thee. Yes. Let me say that one more time. Thy word, whose word? Thy word yes. have I hid in my heart yes. Yes. And that I might not sin against thee. Um, I want to speak to you briefly from the subject today. There's nothing like the real thing. Oh, yes. Amen. There's nothing like the real thing. Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I need your help today. It's impossible for me to communicate eternal truths to find my mind to mess your spirits with me. Guide me in the name of Jesus and hide me behind the cross. The atmosphere has been set. I sense your presence in this building. Even if nobody else senses it, I know that you are here today. Amen. There's someone right now in the sound of my voice that needs a word. And I'm asking that you would deliver it from our mouth to their hearts today. Yes. Forgive us of all sins and shortcomings. Unstop our ears and help us to receive what you have. Above all things, save us into your kingdom. In Jesus' name I do pray. Let every believer say amen. Amen. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. There's nothing like the real thing. Um, some of you probably knew I would talk about this, but today marks the 20th anniversary of the 9-11, September 11th terrorist attacks. Yes, Lord. And you probably could have guessed what I'm going to ask you next. Uh, you probably thought about this many times before. By show of hands, how many of you actually remember where you were and what you were doing when this thing happened? Yeah, I thought so. Um, it was such a memorable event, such a terrible and tragic event that all of us practically can remember exactly where we were. I remember um, I was in high school, academic magnet high school in North Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I was sitting in math class and I just remember uh, that the principal ran into the room, told the teacher to stop teaching, turned the TV to the news, and we literally watched the events of this terrible attack play out over the next few hours. Um, it was quite astonishing, brothers and sisters, to watch planes fly into a building. Are you hearing me today? And, and to watch the building literally crumble live before our eyes. And then later on, for the next few days, to be able to watch the news and find out that people actually jumped off of this building because they knew they would not be able to make it down the stairs in time to save their own life. It was tragic. In fact, it was such a tragic phenomenon that it kind of gripped the entire nation with fear. If you go back and like study statistics and go to the Barna Group, which is a group that studies um, church and religion and spirituality statistics, what they actually will tell you is, is that right after the 9-11 attacks, there was a rush of people into the church. Yes. Did I hear what I preach today? Yes. 
Even people who had never gone to church before, people who had sworn off God, people who don't care anything about religion, they, they, they rushed into the house of God. Um, some churches reported it was like a 6% increase in attendance. Some churches uh, indicated it was like a 40% increase. But nevertheless, people rushed into the house of God. Why? Because they thought the world might be ending and they wanted answers. Right. Yes, yes, yes. And they recognized that the government could be caught off guard by this, that the president and Congress and the Senate, they don't have the answers. Are y'all with me right now? And they recognize that even if they didn't worship God before, maybe there's some answers that I can get from the house of God and they rushed into the church during that September uh, month time. But, but the statistics also tell us that by November, that rush to church was actually very short-lived. And by November, when people finally recognized, okay, yes, this was a tragic event, yes, it was terrible, but maybe the world is not going to end, people just kind of settled back into their normal everyday life. Yes, have mercy. Now, I, I want to use this and suggest something to you today that I pray you won't be offended by, but I'm sharing this for everybody who's listening, people on Zoom right now, somebody who's going to watch this uh, 10, uh, 15 years later on YouTube, however you get this message today. I want to suggest uh, that, that short-lived experiences with God are more commonplace than we think. Oh my. Yes. Oh my. Lord help the preacher that. Then I, I, I want to suggest to you that in fact these short-lived experiences with God are actually a every weekend type of thing. Mercy, Lord. I hear the preacher that. I, I'm saying that this type of rush to God and then settling back into normal life actually ebbs and flows with every weekend which we come into the house of God and we go back to our normal everyday lives. If you understand what the preacher is saying, just say amen real quick. Amen. Um, as a matter of fact, I I was reading this book, Max, we read this book when we first got together, um, The Forgotten Jesus by Rob Gailty. And it's a powerful book. And one of the things that he suggests in the book is this, is that um, Christians, we have this, this thing called bloated information or bloated Christian syndrome. Mercy. Mercy. I told you this is going to be boring, but y'all just stay with me for a minute while I make my case. And I'm simply going to read to you what he says in his book and on page 33, because I thought it was powerful. He said, in this syndrome, members are fed lots of great information every week. Nice. If you were to add up all the facts and data that some people have accumulated from attending church services over several decades, it would surpass that of a biblical scholar. Mercy. Mercy. And yet, watch this, we come experiences having retained almost nothing from what we have heard. Yes. Y'all don't hear the preacher today. In fact, some people would suggest that after you hear a message and after you hear a sermon or a teaching, uh, the message or the teaching, no matter how long it was, actually only lasts at max 72 hours in your mind. So no matter how good the preacher preaches, no matter how well he preaches, no matter how, how well she delivers illustrations or delivers the word to you, at max, the word barely lasts 72 hours. And what can you say? I mean, I really want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to go in your mind right now, and I want you to think about how many times have you been to church? Oh, okay. And you're like, that's, that's a ridiculous question. I've been to church hundreds of times. I mean, thousands of times over my adult life, I have been in the house of God. I've heard message after message. I've been in Sabbath school and prayer meeting. I have heard sermons in an untold number. Well, what Rob Delty is actually saying is, is that man, we, we have increased information, but have not increased commitment to God. Yes, Lord, help the preacher today. And, and he actually suggests, he says that what the problem is, mm -hmm, we have bought into the fallacy that acquiring new information facilitates growth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are y'all with the preacher today? That, that just because you get more information and you amass more knowledge and you acquire more sermons, it doesn't make you any more spiritual. I, I got here with the preacher today. And, and by the way, listen, I love preaching. Come on, say amen. I love the word of God. But at the end of the day, what Rob Gellity actually
said this actually makes a lot of sense. We are not transformed by information. Yes, sir. That's right. Yes, sir. Say that. It's funny. I, I guess I'll tell myself a little bit. Um, <laughs> when I was growing up, uh, my cousin Leia, she would always say this. She was like, John, like you got a whole lot of book smarts, but you lack in a whole lot of common sense. All right. Yeah. All right. Come on, say it in somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like you, you do know you can go to college and you can get a whole lot of degrees and you can acquire information, but that doesn't necessarily make you smart or wise. Is that okay today? <laughs> I'm in the words today. It is funny here because what Rob Galaxy is saying is we have a bloated Christian syndrome. We bought into the fallacy that we grow and we are transformed by acquiring new information. And watch this. For most people, the information that is being acquired is acquired secondhand. Say that. Say that. Talk about it. Say that. Talk about it. Say that. Oh, now listen, I, I love preaching. And I do what I can, brothers and sisters, to deliver uh, an inspiring message, a message that you will engage with, a message that will last at least that 72 hour mark. I, I do my best to put something together. And listen, by the way, I, I know I preach a long time. I apologize for that. But sometimes I try to stay in the 40 minute time frame as best I can. Uh, Pastor Gomez and myself, we, we try to use our skills and to parse the text and to put words together and throw illustrations in there and stuff like that. But the reality is, brothers and sisters, that any 40 minute message that comes your way is still second hand. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but whatever you hear from the pulpit is second hand. It, it is a word that I have masticated, that I have chewed, that I have synthesized, that I have crafted, that I have boiled down to its root, that I can deliver to you. It is not a primary word. Amen. 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 Am I tracking with everybody today? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Come on, say amen, somebody. It is a second hand word. And listen, we are required to preach the word. I'm not saying that preaching is bad. I'm not saying that you liking preaching is bad. And by the way, there's no a problem with you having your favorite preacher or having your favorite expositor of the word. But what we all need to recognize is, is that there is no sermon that can really be preached that can be a substitute for the straight testimony of God's word. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, let me see how I can do this. Um, they, 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 uh, I remember, um, it's funny, man. Um, my wife knows this. I love Taco Bell. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, why do you eat that? Like, all the time. You're like, this is trash. It's disgusting. Why do you eat this? Kind of stuff? I know what it is. I just love it, man. I just love it. Those crunch wraps, supreme, and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I, I love it, man. And, um, you know, one thing that I must have, all right, with my Taco Bell, with my, you know, tortilla or whatever it is I get, y'all, I got to have sour cream. Just oh, can't have it without it. It just don't even make sense to eat it without it. Like, seriously. And it's funny, it's not until I met Max that Max was like, yo, Colton, you do know that that's not a real thing in, in Latin parts of the world. You do know that, right? Like, they, they don't have no sour cream. That's, that's not a thing. And it's funny, like, my wife and I, we just came back from Mexico for an anniversary trip, and we were there. And your boy Max had me shook. Like, I, I was afraid to ask. But one day I got up the gumption to ask, like, do you have any sour cream? And I mean, they looked at me like I was crazy. Like, no, we don't have that. What are you talking about, right? And it's funny, too, like, we even went off the resort, and we went um, into the um, uh, real restaurants on the streets. And here's what I want to tell you today. Um, brothers and sisters, there, there, there are American tortillas. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Y'all don't hear the preachers there. There's authentic Mexican food. Amen. Don't say amen. amen. And, and the taste is not the same. Y'all don't hear me today. And all I'm trying to say is there is nothing like the real thing. Amen. 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 There's nothing like the real thing. The tortilla over there tastes better. Amen. It's more filling. It's like they took more time with it, put their foot in it, put their elbow in it, put love on it. The food tastes better over there Amen. than it does at Taco Bell. Yeah. I still love my Taco Bell, which I'll get what I'm saying. Amen, somebody. All right? And I've I, I realized, man, that all those sermons are good, and they can be preached real well. At the end of the day, they're not the real thing. Amen. 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 And they don't compare 
to the Word of God. Amen. Now it's funny that I should be preaching this to you today because I am a preacher. And listen, in my flesh, I want you to enjoy every word. I want everybody to say amen. I want everybody to pat me on the back and affirm me when I'm done. But at the end of the day, I have to be true to my calling and let you know that this sermon, any sermon, is not the end all be all. In fact, can I use another food illustration if you don't mind? Um, food, uh, uh, sermons are like pasta. Come on, oh, my. Okay. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> Is fettuccine Alfredo. And one of the things that we recognize when we eat it from what we cook it from time to time is like you eat pasta and then like an hour later you're like mad hungry. It's almost like you didn't eat anything at all. So I have like, gone on Google this week to try to figure out like what in the world causes this phenomenon. Like I know I ate enough, I eat just as much as I would eat of anything else. Why am I still hungry? And like Google was telling me that 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 um uh, 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 fettuccine and pasta and dough is made up of what's called simple carbohydrates and they're bonded together with these bonds and really when it goes into the system it converts into glucose which is kind of like a sugar but when this glucose like gets in, in, in contact with the stomach acid it is immediately broken down broken down so quickly by the insulin that your body produces that you feel very hungry after eating so much so it's almost like you didn't eat at all I want to know, God, what should I do here? 
how should I do it? But listen, brothers and sisters, that's not all the Word of God is designed to do. The, 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 the Word of God is not your personal advice giver. All right. All right. The, 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 the Word of God is designed that when you read it, you would do everything in your power to assimilate your entire life to what the Word says. Amen. Amen. The Word is designed to help you line up your life with the Word. Amen. But if we only come in every now and then, every blue moon just to see and take a peek or to read what it says, then we are not as connected to God as we actually think. Mercy. Amen. This is why David says today, hallelujah, thy word. Yes, 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 yes. Have I hid in my heart yes. that I might not sin against thee? Yes, now, do y'all mind today if I just break down this text just for a minute? Is that okay with everybody today? Yes, so. um, David says, I'm going to break it down because I, I think it's powerful um, phrase by phrase and, and word by word here today. Um, David says, thy word. Uh, what word? Uh, uh, thy word. Yeah. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, this book is the word of God. Amen. Yes, Amen. Hear me today. This is the word of God. Uh, and I wish I could take you through um, <clears throat> everything I learned in school about how the word was constructed, but I'll just give you the five points, and some of you know this. This is 66 books written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years, and they're all saying the same thing. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, if you didn't know that, that doesn't make any sense. Anybody ever played the telephone game? Yes. Yeah. Come on, y'all. Uh -huh. You whisper in somebody here, they whisper in the next and next and the next, and by the time they get to the end, it's something totally different. Yeah. Right. The, the Bible is letting us know that there are 40 different authors. Many of them never met each other at all. There were kings and there were shepherds and, and there were poets and, and there were different kinds of people. And over a span of 1,500 years, somehow they came out with the same message. Uh -huh. Amen. This is God's book. It is His book. Amen. Amen. But, but I, I need you to follow me today. So here's what I want you to do. Because, I mean, how can I preach a message about the Word of God if I don't get you in the Word? You got your Bibles out, right? You got your phones or your tablets. Come on with me. I need you to go to 2 Peter. Yep. Yeah. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21. I, I want you to get a Bible study today. I want you to get familiar with the Word. Somebody doesn't know where 2 Peter is. It's right after 1 Peter. Amen, somebody. Come on, say amen. Right. New Testament, right after 2 Peter. Can't miss it. 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> and verse 20 and 21. Look, look at what the word says. Above all, yes. you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation amen. of things. Amen. For a prophecy never had its origin in the human will. <laughs> but prophets, though humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. He, here's what Peter's saying. Peter's saying this book did not originate in the four corners of any human being's mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody woke up one morning and said, I am going to write the Bible. Right. Nobody woke up one morning. Paul did not wake up and be like, I'm going to write this, and then it's going to be put together with Moses' writings, and then with Solomon's writings, and then with every, all the other prophets' writings. Like, Paul did not wake up and do that, but he, he was ushered into writing by the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, yes. Meaning God gave them the wisdom and the knowledge they needed to write this book. And I want to be clear, y'all, this is why the Bible is a primary source. Amen. Amen. All right. I was funny because uh, as I'm in school, um, my, my last class, the teacher, she was like, for this next paper, I want you to write, I want you to cite sources that are primary sources. All right. Good and in other words, I, I didn't understand what it was, so I had to figure it out. And, and she was like, um, primary sources are people who were there. That's right. That's right. Help me with that. People who actually did the experiment. They know what happened. They were in the space. They saw how everything played out. And they're writing their observations. I want you to do that because your paper will have more validity and more credibility if it comes from primary sources. Yeah, 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 yeah. The reason our lives, help me, Father, do not have the credibility and don't have the validity and don't have the spirituality yeah. is because most of our knowledge and information does not come from primary sources. All right now. <laughs> comes 
from the preacher. Amen. He's doing a good job, but we praise God for him. And he may reference the word of God, but he is not God. Amen. Amen. Hello. Amen. Help, help the preacher today. Um, and in fact, this is God's word, and God's word is holy. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I said his word is holy. Oh, that's right. In fact, his word is so holy that at the end of the book, God says, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to add anything to my word. <laughs> I don't want you to take nothing away. I don't want you to dress it up. I don't want you to put no makeup on it. I don't want you to make it look better. I want you to tell the truth as it is in Jesus. Don't try to flip it. Don't try to put sparkles on it. Don't put no rhinestones on it. Don't try to make it more palatable. Preach the word. Amen. Am I in the book or am I in the book? Amen. That's what the Bible says here. And God is saying, in fact, if you add anything to God's word, yes. or you take anything from God's word, God said he would add a curse to your life. Yes. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. The Bible is holy, and it's not supposed to be taken like that. Now, it's funny, man. Uh, I remember growing up, and my dad, like, <laughs> yeah, did y'all grow up in a home where your parents or your grandmother would never let you put anything on top of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
chapter 5 and verse 10. Look at what the word says here. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. The word says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, now watch this. So that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Come on, say amen. And so it's not going to be you and Pastor Coachman standing before God. Y'all won't hear the preacher today. It's going to be you by yourself because the Bible says we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for what we have done or what we have not done. And in that moment, you can't say Pastor Coachman didn't preach good enough. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. You can't say the music wasn't good enough. The Lord help me today. There will be no excuse that hilltop worship wasn't the way I wanted it to be. Because before every person leaves this earth, they have an opportunity to read the word for themselves. Amen. By the way, this is the most translated, the most published book in history. Come on, say amen to somebody. Amen. This ain't like you gotta go to Barnes and Noble and spend twenty-five dollars to get it. You can go almost. You can go. Matter of fact, there's Bibles in the dollar store. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Matter of fact, we're going further than that. On your smartphone, the word is free. Amen. amen. Are y'all here to preach? Mm -hmm. Yeah. David says, "Have I here in my heart?" Watch this. Um, your experiences on Sabbath should drive you to the word. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Man, as, as, as Letitia was singing the song, um, um, uh, the song that she was singing, uh, I, I was thinking about Psalms 27, y'all. That's actually one of my favorite texts, and that's what she was singing just a minute ago. And I, I, I may have said this before, but when I get on planes, because I hate planes, I don't like being in control, um, I always quote what she sang today. Amen. And see, as she sang it, I can actually identify and identify with what she was saying. Right. Now see, most of us are impressed by the chords that are played. Yes, right. And by how the drummer is playing real well. And the voices are singing in harmony and it sounds good. The melody is good. But I can identify with the lyrics. Amen. The Lord is my light my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yes. The Lord is the strength of my life. And whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came to come and eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. You can understand what they're actually singing about up here. Right. And it'll actually make sense to you. See, see the singing dries up by tomorrow. Yes, yeah. 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 The praise and worship is practically gone by Tuesday. Y'all don't hear me. But if you know the word and you can identify with what she's singing or what is being said, it'll last much longer. Amen. Y'all Amen. okay today, right? Amen. Um, we, we have to take an active role in our salvation. Uh -huh. I mean, I say this last time, but um, it's not my job to save you. Right. Uh -huh. That's right. I want you to be saved. God knows I do. Right. I'll do everything in my power to make sure that you are saved, but I cannot do for you what you can do for yourself. Yes. Lord, help the preacher. Okay. Um, I, I guess I better move. David says, Thy word have I. Right. Then David says, hid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very powerful word. Yes. Break it down. That was, the, that was the who and the what. But now David is talking about the how. He says, I've hid. Now, brothers and sisters, if you hide anything, mm -hmm. hiding implies intentionality. Right. Yes. Right. It implies effort on your part. Yes. Amen. It implies that you meant to do the text doesn't say, thy word have I lost. That's passive. <laughs> the word says, thy word have I hid. That's active. Which means that David is saying, I have taken steps to make sure that the word is hidden in my heart. It means that I treasure it. That's right. Amen. That, 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 that we love the word enough, that we value it enough to hide it in our hearts so it can never be taken. Please stay awake just a little while longer. I need you to hear this. See, our issue, brothers and sisters, 
is that we memorize the text. Mm. Oh Lord. All right. Now. Oh Lord. All right now. Mm. Watch out. I said that. I said, good. I said our issue is we memorize the text. Mm. Now listen, there's, there, um, it's not a bad thing to memorize. Okay, cool. But we kind of do that and then we stop. Come on, say that. But I actually agree with Miles Monroe. Um, instead of memorizing the text, I'd rather you meditate on yeah, the text. Amen. Oh, amen. Wow. Oh, wow. Amen. Yes. <clears throat> in other words, in simple, instead of, you know, by the way, it's funny because, like, in school, like, you can get away with, like, passing quizzes and tests by simply regurgitating everything the teacher said. Y'all know that, right? Yeah, I did that all through middle school. I'm not by myself, right? Right, right. Um, you can get away with that. But, 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 but being able to regurgitate something doesn't mean that you know it. Right. That's right. And it certainly doesn't mean that it has transformed your life. Amen. I, I would rather you spend time meditating on the word. That word, have I hit my heart that I might not sin against thee? The Lord is, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I, I would much rather you meditate on the word and know it for yourself rather than you being able to quote it back in Sabbath school. Right. Mm. That's right. Oh my. Treasure the word. Amen. Hide the word in your heart so much so that you know it and you actually understand what it means. And see, the problem that we have is we memorize, but we don't live. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What? Okay. I know this is a hard word, but, but th this is what God told me to preach today. Are y'all with me? Yeah. But it, 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 it's a fact, brothers and sisters. We memorize stuff, and because we memorize it, the devil has tricked us into believing that we got it, but we don't live it. Amen. Have mercy. And see, I would rather one text and, and meditate on it rather than taking a whole bunch of texts and not living any of them. Okay. Um, Rob, Rob Gallaty, that same book that I mentioned ago, I promise I'm almost done. Stay with you. Um, he actually says, he says that the way we study nowadays, that's a Western thing. Oh my. And it's not a thing that the ancient Jewish leaders, as well as Jesus, would have done. Okay. In fact, in their time, you gotta read this book, it's called The Forgotten Jesus. I promise you it will blow your mind. In the book, he actually says that the Jewish scholars and religious leaders, and maybe Jesus himself, that they would take one text. Okay, oh, help me with that. And they would turn it around okay. over and over and over again. And they would rehearse what it says. I mean, for months, maybe dozens of times. And then they would move on to something else. I see. Wow. You see, what we do, brothers and sisters, I, I, I hope y'all are here. Um, what we do is we keep piling on information. And so every single one, and I'm not blaming you, your, your relationship with Jesus, what it is, but we read different devotionals every single day. Right. Right. Mercy. Mm -hmm. no, no, no. Right. And see, um, the, the, every day that we read something new, we are doubling the content. Uh -huh. Stay with me. Right, right. But the more you double the content, the more you dilute the impact. Wow. Right. Right. Wow. You won't get this tomorrow, I promise. <laughs> like, if we would just take one text from time to time and say, I'm going to stay here as long as I can until I understand what God is trying to say, it would actually But every week we want the pastor to preach a brand new sermon. We want new flips, new tricks. We want him to dance. We want him to jig. Have mercy. Y'all bad? It's okay. Have mercy. We want the preacher to have new illustrations. We want him to entertain us. We want the praise team to always be on point. We want everything to be perfect. Have mercy. Oh my. Oh my. Have mercy. But if we were doing our own study, the impact would be just as great. Okay, I told you this was going to be boring, but I'm going to move on. Um, we have, in a sense, educated ourselves beyond our obedience. Have mercy. Ooh. Have mercy. Ooh. Have mercy. Ooh. Oh my. Have mercy. Thank God for you two. Y'all going to have to go back and listen to this for yourself, because I know it's not the way you're used to me preaching or, or me being you know, animated and all this kind of stuff, but I promise you there's a word for you today. Uh -huh. We have educated ourselves beyond our obedience. You have amassed so much biblical information over the years that you can't even obey everything that you have been given because you haven't taken time to rehearse any of it in your life. Okay. Wow. Mercy. Wow. We are so educated, we can't even obey. Have mercy. 
Lord, God help the preacher today. Um, it's all right. It's okay. I promise. David says that word, have I it. I value it. When I see a text that means something to it, I quote it to myself. I write it down and put it on my refrigerator. I rehearse what it says. If it's a promise from God, I believe it. If I happen to encounter it in the real world, then I will quote the passage. I will share it with other people. I will pray over the passage. I will share it with my spouse. I will use it for Friday night Bible study with the family and family worship. I will use the text until it has an impact and it has an active place in my life. David finally says, um, in my heart. Where do I hide? Oh, I hide it in my heart. And that's the primary seat of influence. I can quote the words. I mean, Solomon says in Proverbs 4, 23, above all things, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. David said, if I'm going to put the word anywhere, yes, I'm going to put it on my refrigerator and put it in my car and put it on the note section of my phone, but most of all, I'm going to put it in my heart. And my text, as we hide the word in our heart, Jesus quietly walks into our lives. Yes. And you know what I've noticed? This, is, uh, this may just be the, I don't know, but hopefully you've had this experience too. Like when I spend time, like, like really spend time on a passage reading it for myself, I always find that God finds a way my everyday life. Amen. Amen. I mean, it will almost be that when I walk out of my home, the word will become real. Amen. Not like the Psalms 27, Lord, my life, my salvation, whom shall I fear? Lord, strength of my life, for whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come to eat of my flesh, they stumble and fail. It's almost like after I read the passage and meditate on it for a while, I will come into work, and the same people that are hating on me and didn't like me, like they will get booted out of the way, like God will move people out of the way. And although God may be moving in our life, we will never see it. Mercy, mercy. Mm. I love this quietness today. This means that I hope that you're thinking about what the preacher is saying today. David says, in my heart, as we study the word, Jesus quietly comes in. And when you hide it, God begins to like illustrate things in your life. And listen, I don't know about you, but the more I read the word, I fall more in love with Jesus. Amen. Yes. Amen. Because I recognize that his word is true. Yeah. And so I'm like, actually, man, when my wife and I was going through some stuff, and like, God, you know, we got these debts to pay, we got these things going on. Like, like what, what made the text real is that we, we began to read that text. I was like, I'm young. I have been young and I have been old. But, but, but I have never forsaken, nor his seed that he breaks. Like when you read the word and understand what it says, like when the Bible says all the silver and the gold are his, and even the cattle on a thousand hills. When God says, I own it all, I am the God of all flesh. If I needed anything, I would not ask you. Amen. The Bible becomes real. Amen. And we don't have these experiences because we listen to preachers more than the prophetic word. Come. Amen. Um, let me finish up so I can leave y'all alone. David says finally that I might not sin against thee. Yes. Why do you hide the word? So that you will not disappoint God. Amen. Hear me today. So that you will not hurt the heart of God. So that you would not fall privy to temptation unnecessarily. Uh -huh. David said, I have hid the word in my heart. And I want you to follow me right now, brothers and sisters. The, the, the word of God taken in by the believer is supposed to have a demonstration of real power in real life. Uh -huh. All right. In other words, you should see opportunities and experiences where God's word has kept you despite yourself. Oh my. Mm -hmm. 
Stop it. Help me. All right, let's go. Second Timothy, last text. I promise. Maybe. I don't know. Y'all too quiet. Let's see. Let's get Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Come on. Yeah. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. The Bible says this all scripture. Yes. How much? Oh. How much, y'all? Oh. Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Some versions say, I love this bit, I just love the language of the Bible. Some says the, the, the word is God breathed. Yes. I love that. Right? And God breathed. And the Bible says it is profitable. Yes. That means it's valuable. That means you stand to gain by reading it. You will never lose by reading the word. Even if you're late to work, read the word. You can't lose. It, oh, let me say today, somebody gonna be mad at me. Even if you're late to church. Oh, Lord, help me today. Y'all want me to stay here? I'm trying to move on. Come on, I'm trying to quit. If you got to read the word to get into the right spirit so you're not rude and nasty when you come into the house of God, please stay home. Mercy. The Bible says it's profitable, right? And watch what the word says. The Bible says the word is profitable for doctrine. That's what's right. Profitable for reproof. That's what's not right. It's profitable for correction. That's how to get right. And profitable for instruction. That's how to stay right. Amen. Everything you need is right here in the Word of God. And David said, I read it, I value it, I treasure it, I hide it in my heart. So when I get that text late at night, I have the ability to say no. God, God, I'm seeing this preacher today. When he comes sliding in my DMs, I can slide him right back out. Y'all hear the preacher today. When I'm afraid for my life, I have the word hidden in my heart. I know that God will take care of me. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from what's coming from my help. My help coming from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He shall not slumber nor sleep. That's the word. I hide the word so it will have demonstrated power in my life. And I'll be able to live the best life that God wants me to live. You know what's powerful to me? One of the first texts that I ever read. I want you to play in two minutes. No matter what. I don't care how much I got left. We'll just play. And I'm going to keep on preaching all day. Watch this. Uh, Psalm chapter 1. You've got to read this text yes. and understand what it says. Yes. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of our God. No standeth in the way of sinners, no sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight yeah. is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night, but that ain't the best part. And he shall be as a tree yeah. planted by the rivers of water, who bringeth forth fruit in his season, and his leaf also shall not wither. The ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. You delight in his word, you are blessed. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Ain't nothing like the real thing. Uh -huh. You can't get as blessed by Pastor Coach or Pastor Gomez's preaching as you can by simply reading the word of the Almighty God. That's right. And listen, I just stopped by here, honestly, like for real, just to tell you all, brothers and sisters, this is going to sound so crazy, so corny, so lackluster, anti-climatic, but here it is. Pick up the word. You want to know how I came to faith? I'm closing the Bible now. You don't want to know how I came to faith? Literally. It was junior high or senior year in high school. My dad was like, son, I think you'd be a good preacher. I was like, eh, I don't know. They shout and scream, they don't make a lot of money. <laughs> I don't think it's worth my time. It's right. uh, but I didn't know what else I wanted to do. So I said, you know, I'm back. I think it was the Holy Spirit that deposited this in my mind. Holy Spirit was like, yo. Just read the word for yourself and see if there's some answering chord in you. I get you now. 
So I went to my dad. I can see it vividly right now. And I asked him, I said, Daddy, what, what, what should I read? Where should I start? I just want to see this thing out for myself. He said, Son, start in the four Gospels. Yeah, yeah, all right. That's my job. Now, I wasn't a Bible scholar or student at that time, but I knew that that was in the middle of the Bible. Like, hey, now, why would you tell me to start in the middle of the Bible? And he was like, Son, if you get Jesus, you get everything else. Amen. He said, Read the story of Jesus. Kid you not, uh, right, right where, uh, where I was at home on Boston Street in Charleston, South Carolina, I opened the word, I started pouring through Matthew, started pouring through Mark and Luke and John, and I kid you not, like the words of Jesus were so powerful, they struck me. It was almost as if God like, took his bow and arrow and he was pulling it back and shooting me in my heart. Amen. I may stop calling you somebody, but it's real. And I'll never forget, I had like, this sticky pad next, uh, next to me on my desk, and all the text that stood out to me, like I wrote them down on a piece of paper, and I just stuck them on the window, and after like a few weeks passed, brothers and sisters, like my entire window was covered with the word of God. Amen. Huh. Amen. All I'm trying to tell you is, I came to faith in my room. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yes, with just the word of God. Now, I don't fault anybody for coming to faith after they heard a powerful message. Praise God, I'm happy that you're here. And I'm grateful that if somebody came in town and they did an evangelistic or a tech effort and they preached to real happy, I praise God for it. But I pray that that is not the extent of your spiritual experience. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Pray that you go to your room and you'll read the word and you'll cover your life with the words of the living God. Come on, come on, yeah. If you want to live a better life, yes. if you want to be blessed, oh, here we go. If you want to be saved, yes. Amen. read this word for yourself. Somebody in the sound of my voice right now is afraid to get into the word. I'm not supposed to know where to start. I don't get it. First of all, we got Bible studies. Pastor Gomez is conducting like four or five Bible studies right now. We will be happy to study the Word with you. Uh -huh. But we want to tell you this. Don't be afraid of God's Word. God's Word is not designed to make you feel bad. It's to help get you on the right path. You start reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John right now, I promise you, your life will be much better than you ever thought possible. Is there anybody out there, y'all, only me by myself? Is there anybody out there by showing their hands or just by saying amen and say, Pastor Coso, after giving my life to Christ and reading the word, my life is ten times better than what it was before. Matter of fact, after the word, like, listen, I don't even look like what I've been through. But like, if not for the word, I might be dead. If not for the word, I wouldn't be as cleaned up as I am right now. The word of God has been a marked change in my life. Today I'm begging and I'm pleading for you to read God's word for yourself. Last thing I'll make my appeal, I'm sitting down. It's funny. Because Psalms chapter 119, longest chapter in the Bible. Yeah. Uh -huh. I gave the 70 Psalm Mark verses. Crazy. But you know what's funny about that whole chapter? Crazy, crazy, crazy. Every verse is David expressing how much he loves God's word. Amen. Uh -huh. Go in the Bible. Go ahead, read it. I promise you. Look, look at every, every single verse. David is even talking about God's word, his precepts, or his commandments. Yes. And for a man who has been through so much, he is saying, God, I value your word. And I always want it to be a part of my life. All right, here's what we're going to do. Um, yeah, let's do it this way. If you just believe what the preacher is saying today, and you're saying, preacher, I hear you. I need to get into the word for myself. I understand what you are saying. And the word of God is just as powerful as you say. Come on, stand to your feet. Just in agreement today. Just in agreement. That's it. We ain't asking nobody to make no major commitment right now. Just stand. Just say, yep, I agree. I hear you. I hear you. And here's the next appeal. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Here's the next one. Somebody right now. Because, see, there, there's nothing like the real thing. Nothing. You want your life to be better? Read the word. Period. Yes, it comes away. But read the word. Yes, go to the doctor. But claim the promises of Scripture. Take your medicine. Yes. But do what God says also. Hear me then. 
That's my next appeal to say. You just want to say, God, I, I, I want to make that commitment with David today. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. If your desire is not to hurt the heart of God, I just want you to lift your hands. That's it. Nobody needs to look around at anybody. Nobody needs to see anything and say, God, I commit my life to you. To your word. I'm thankful for the sermons. I'm thank you for the messages and for the preaching. But I'm going to be more intentional about hiding your word in my heart. If that's you, come on, keep your hand lifted. Keep it lifted. And I'm going to pray for you right now. Somebody needs to make that commitment to God right now. You're suffering. You're depressed. You're lonely. You're going through something. You don't have peace. There is no contentment in your life. I am giving you the antidote free of charge. 66 books will change your life. I have read every word. You need it. Trust me today. Commit yourself to reading a Bible God bless you. Father, in the name of Jesus, today I'm done. What you've asked me to do, I've done everything that is required of me. I've delivered to your people your book. Now, Lord, help us to be like David, to hide it in our hearts so that we'll have better lives. That, that, oh, thank you, Jesus. And we will be able to see your hand in our lives. That we'll be able to see how you move. And, and we'll draw closer to you. Thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Thank you, Jesus, for writing us 66 love letters to tell us how much you care. You did not leave us by ourselves. The very answers of life are in your word. If we would but read, you would bless us. So we submit today and we surrender to you. And we ask that you do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. In fact, put a desire in us to read your word. Yes. Build it. Create it. Stoke the fire within us that we may be passionate about it every day. Thank you in advance for what you're going to do. And Father, if you never do another thing, Lord, my prayer is that you will save us into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Let every believer say amen. 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 If you believe God's word, put your hands together for God, not for me. If you just believe God's word, somebody here is going to be blessed. But this week, I promise you, you're going to take the challenge, you're going to read the word, and your life is going to be blessed. Amen to my Come on, put your hands together one more time for God. Thank you, Jesus, for the word.